لا علم إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم لا علم إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم لا علم إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت الحكيم العليم اللهم انشر علينا رحمة وانزل علينا حكمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام اللهم انشر علينا رحمتك وانزل علينا حكمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام اللهم انشر علينا رحمتك وانزل علينا حكمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم صلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله وصحبه وسلم تسليما إن شاء الله we did the introduction last week and it's it's actually should have been on here it's page one so I'll get that to you um, for people that had this before please uh, uh, burn the other one don't throw it away because it has the Arabic on it um, burn it or shred it or something um, because there's been what's that I don't know if, if it doesn't shred the letters um, you, you still have to burn it so because the letters I mean technically all languages are actually considered sacred and should be honored that's what I was taught um, by one of my teachers more Tanya and Sheikh um, because he said the probability of of the language having revelation is too high um, and so but Arabic definitely these letters are in the Quran and there are verses of Quran that are letters Adif Lamim those are letters right so and then to respect for the written word so but discard that because there are mistakes in it and I corrected them uh, most of them inshallah and because this is a work in progress as they say right. so after the introduction he says and this in in Arabic there's a play on words here he he says I begin I begin or I began by starting with the heart of beginnings or I say beginning with the heart of beginnings uh, which is courtesy spelt backward uh, since this is the highest and noblest of beginnings. What he's saying is you look at the word al-bad, right, which is, it has to do with like beginning, bada'a um, yabda'u is the root, and from it you get bedu, the first people, bedui, the Bedouin. What happens, he says, فَقُلْتُ بَادِيًا بِقَلْبِ الْبَدْئِ I say by qalb al bedi It literally means the heart. I begin with the heart of beginning. But it also, it's a play on words. Because it also means, and I begin by flipping bedi the word bedi around. Because qalb means heart, but it also means to turn over. So what he's saying is, I'm, I'm beginning by flipping the beginning over. And if you flip it over, you get adab. Right? So the word bada, which means beginning, if you turn it around, it means adab. So what he's saying is, I'm beginning with adab. Right? It's, it's just a, you know, the Arabs like to, to uh, do things like this in their poetry and, and in their writing. It's, uh, it's a word play. So he's saying, I begin by, at, with the heart of beginnings. And what he means by that adab. So he's saying that, He's beginning with adab because this is the highest and noblest of beginnings. فَأَدَبْ مَعَ اللَّهِ عَلَى وَجَلَّ بِأَن تُلَازِمَ الْحَيَاءُ وَذُلَّ So he's saying have adab with Allah. Now the word adab in Arabic means a lot of things. Adib has come to mean uh, an erudite person. Somebody who's learned is an adib. And the reason the Arabs say that is because generally with learning comes manners and so really at the root of the word adab is courtesy there's an idea of courtesy um, so somebody who's an ad a muaddib is a teacher of children so the idea that the muaddib if you look at the word muaddib uh, it literally means 
the one who is causing somebody to have adab. So the, the teacher of children is somebody really who's teaching them how to behave properly. That's the idea. So behavior is at the heart of this science. It's about proper behavior. And what he's saying is, فَأَدَبْ مَعَ Allah. You know, have adab with Allah. Behave properly with Allah before anybody. Right? That's the most important thing is to behave properly with Allah. And how do you do that? That's what he's saying. بِأَن تُلَازِمَ الْحَيَاءُ وَذُلَّةِ You do it with two things. Haya and dhul. Now, haya in Arabic, which, is anybody Filipino here? Huh? Now, there's a word that they use in Tagalog, which is really important in Filipino culture, not just Muslim culture. Uh, haya or... Huh? Hiya. Yeah. Hiya. Is that it? Yeah, in Filipino, shame. In Filipino culture, not just Muslim, amongst the Tagalog, the, the, Tagalog, the northern Filipinos, hiya is shame. It's a very important concept in their culture. Christian Filipinos as well as other Filipinos. And, and that is from the Muslim influence on the, the Filipinos, because the, the Muslims had a big influence on the Filipinos before the Spanish got there. What's that? In Pakistan, same thing. Yeah, haya is a big concept here. Now, the root uh, word of haya is related to life itself, right? Hay is living. Hayat is life. It's related to life itself. Now, one of, uh, there's a famous hadith that every religion has a quality that, that is characteristic of that religion. The kulli dinin khuluq. Wa khuluq al-islam al And the character of my religion is haya, is shame. Now what shame means, right? We, we use this word shame. And if you grow up in this culture, Probably not anymore, but if, and you're dating yourself by admitting this, but if, if, if you grew up in this culture, you would have heard as a child, shame on you, right? Shame on you. And now it's a bad word, shame. In, in, in modern American culture, don't shame a child. It's considered a bad thing to do. You know, everything, it's okay, self-esteem, make them feel good about themselves. You know, even if they just uh, slit their brother's throat, well, he's obviously had a trying childhood and, you know, we have to make allowances or something. I mean, this is what this culture has gone to. In traditional culture, uh, they, they divide cultures into shame and guilt cultures, anthropologists. They say that guilt is an inward mechanism and shame is an outward mechanism, which shows how much they understand about this concept. What they mean by that, guilt comes from a German word uh, which has to do with debt. And so when you're indebted, you feel an obligation to the person you're indebted to. The idea is what guilt does, if you do something wrong, there's an internal mechanism that you feel guilty. And you want to relieve that guilt by rectifying what you've done wrong. So, most primitive cultures are not guilt-based cultures. They're shame-based cultures. The reason you don't do something wrong is because you don't want other people to uh, shame you. You don't want other people to say, how could you, how dare you do that? Have shame on you. And you don't want to bring shame on your family on your, on your tribe, on these things. Now, what Islam does to that concept is it honors it. It honors it. In this culture, it's been completely dishonored. It honors it. But what it does is it takes it to another level. And that level is that you have shame before Allah. In other words, you recognize that Allah, even if people don't see you, Allah always sees you. 
and you have shame before the angels. So it takes it to another level, which is the unseen world. So the Muslims are a shame-based culture, but that shame uh, transcends the cultural uh, sense of feeling shame towards one's elders or towards one's parents and takes it to another level which has an interior mechanism that is not akin to guilt. So the point is that haya is having shame before Allah. And that's why he says if you want to have adab with Allah, in other words, correct behavior, have shame. Have a sense of shame. In other words, have a, a feeling that Allah is watching you and so you feel shameful to do something that's displeasing to Him when you know He's watching you. In the same way, most healthy people don't want to do something displeasing to their parents when they watch them because their parents uh, are the means to which they came into existence. They've supported them all their life. They've, you know, the mother uh, changed the, 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 cleaned the child and did and spent nights awake for the child, all these things. So this is an honoring of the parents and you don't want to do something that you would feel ashamed of in front of your parents, right? So that's what he's telling us. And then the other thing, now another thing uh, that he tells us is to have dhul. And dhalil is somebody who is... Dhalil is somebody who is uh, lowly, abject, humbled. Dhalil. Like dhilla. Dhul wal hawan in the Quran. It mentions about people that incur the anger of Allah get this dhul thrust upon them. What, what he's saying is have this before Allah. Be dhalil. A dhalil is like a slave that's afraid to do anything. In, in the presence of his master. There's a type of humble. And so that's what he's, his definition of adab is having these two things. And then, then he says, munkasiran tahtar haya wa khadi'a tahtar mahabati ilahi bari'a. Not only that, but being dejected out of shame. You're munkasir. Munkasir means broken in kasara. So you're literally broken in the presence of Allah when you recognize that you're bringing to Allah your, yourself and your and your wrong actions, and it's what they say. It's not much home, m not much to write home about, right? In other words, when you really think about all Allah has given you, and then you think about what you've uh, given to Allah, you feel this inkisar, munkasir and tahtar haya out of shame, khadi'an, and also khada'a means to be humbled before Allah in awe. تَحْتَ الْمَهَابَةِ إِلَيْهِ ضَارِعَةِ And imploring him to change your state. So this is what he's saying is adab with Allah. And then he says, مُلْغٍ مُرَادَكَ إِلَى مُرَادِهِ خَارٍ مِنَ الطَّمَعِ فِي عِبَادِهِ That you give up what you desire, your designs, you're emptied of them for what he desires of you. So now what it's saying is you're giving up you, what you desire. And the Prophet ﷺ said, or is reported to have said, لا يؤمن وحدكم حتى يكون هواه تبعا لما جئت به. None of you truly believes until his desires are in accordance with the very thing that I've brought. In other words, your murad is the murad of what the Prophet brought, and what the Prophet ﷺ brought is what Allah wants from us. So that's what he's saying is adab with Allah, is to empty, give up your designs for his. Emptied of desire. And moreover, not having tama. Tama is, tama'un is greed, avarice, desire, right? Always wanting something out of something. Every time you do something, you, there's an ulterior motive. That's a, a tama, is somebody he's always got... He wants something out of it. What, what's in it for me? That's always his, his root. And he's saying get rid of that concerning his servants. In other words, don't want anything from his servants. Want something from Allah because Allah is the one that possesses everything. So this is what he's saying. This is how he begins by giving us a definition of adab. And ultimately, and then he says, مُبَادَرًا لِأَمْرِهِ وَمِنْ دَخَلْ دَخَلٌ in Arabic is a hidden fault. It's, it's an aib inside you that nobody sees. And he's saying, uh, quickly go to what he's commanded you to do and uh, 
beware of this isa'at uh, al-adab, this hidden fault of bad adab with Allah, having bad courtesy with Allah. And it's very subtle because there's a hadith that says, إِنَّ أَحَدُكُمْ لَا يَتَكَلَّمُوا بِكَرِيمَةٍ لَا يُرْقِي لَهَا بَالًا وَتَجُرُّهُ سَبْعِينَ خَرِيفٍ فِي النَّارِ One of you will say a word and he gives it no consideration at all. And it will take him 70 years into the hell, hellfire. So the point is, is that adab is a, it, it's a subtle thing. And, and loss of adab. And this is why one of the things that you learn in diplomatic circles is there's something called protocol. And very common amongst people who get into circles that they really don't belong in is they make breaches of protocol and they don't even know it. And everybody else is totally aware of it. Now, this is exaggerated in a, a genteel society where all the forks, there's like for every, and it's uh, obviously an object of comedy in a lot of films where somebody will not know which fork or knife to use with the salad and, the, and he's making a fool of himself. It's a breach of adab. Right? And sometimes you're aware of it, but other times you're not. Right? Now, obviously, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, there are many things, if you don't learn the commands of Allah, you won't know when you're breaking them. If you don't know what a stop sign is, you just pass through it. You know, somebody says, didn't you see that what? The, the, the stop sign. Oh, that red thing? Is that what that means? Yeah. If you don't know what it means, you don't care. You just go right through it. Right? But the problem is, accidents happen that way. And with Allah bad things happen. When you breach adab with Allah, bad things happen. You bring uh, harm on yourself. This is why he's saying, Fi ayi wajib. Be, what kind, this should be a serious fear of yours. To have, and I was once uh, in Mauritania, and there was a, I was with this sheikh, and we saw this mouse, and it was coming out of this, uh, this uh, hole. And, uh, and it would come out, and if it just heard one sound, it would stop and shoot back into the hole. And he said, that's taqwa. <laughs> you know, that, that, that is taqwa. It's your, you know, you're worried about getting eaten alive by your own mistakes. Right? So, so you have this kind of wajal or this, this fear of Allah. Now, ultimately, it turns into love. I mean, that's the highest maqam, and he'll get into that later. So our fear is not like, you know, Allah is this horrible... No, on the contrary. But uh, you don't want to incur the wrath because Allah does have a wrath. And then he says um, here, I'm going to go through this quicker than I did the last time because we need to get on with this. And then he said, In tatahakkaq bi sifatika tumad, ya yuhal abdu bi awsaf al samad. If you realize your attributes of servitude, you are assisted with the attributes of the independent one. What this means is, if you have haya, if you have dhul, if you have faqar, right, poverty, right, And if you realize these qualities or these attributes and empty yourself, right, of, of, of all uh, its opposites, like shameless behavior, uh, arrogance, kibar, or iz, actually, um, and khudu' is the opposite of kibar, and then faqar, ghina. What he's saying is, if you realize, so this is uh, shame, Poverty uh, and hu humbleness and right, uh, so you get freedom, wealth, and is dignity. What he's saying is, if you do that, then you will gain dignity from Allah and wealth. So, in other words, by by realizing your ubudiyah to Allah, you get the hurriya. That's real freedom. Because in, in completing your ubudiyah to Allah, you're no longer a slave to yourself. And that's the only free person. Right? Anybody who's a slave to... If you can't control yourself, you're a slave to yourself. Somebody can say, I'm free. But then when the food shows up, they, they can't stop themselves. That's not freedom as far as the Muslims are concerned. Somebody say, I'm free. 
But when uh, an opportunity to have illicit relations uh, emerges, they can't control themselves, right? Even if they're the president of the United States, right? Seriously. He's a, he's a, he's a Rhodes Scholar, went to uh, Cambridge, you know, highest levels of education, and yet he's a slave to the, the lowest aspects of himself. He can't control himself, right? And that, for us, that's, that is not a free person. That is Abdul Hawa. He's slave of his passions. So Abdullah is the one that when that situation arises, he has taqwa of Allah. And even though the, the temptation might be there, the, the, the desire, because human beings are human, the shahwa might be there, something like that, he can control it because he's not an abd of it. He's a sayyid of it. So if, if, if it's the wife or the husband, then the shahwa is mubaha, it's permissible. But when it's illicit, and that's the that's the hur. That's somebody who's free. Same with any other shahwa. You look at all of them. They're all the same. And those are the more common ones. Imam Al Ghazali says the stomach and the genitals are the two dominant ones. If you can control those, the other ones are easy. But the tongue is the same. There's people who can't stop backbiting. You tell them. You can tell them. And I've seen this. Amaze me. I've seen this literally. I've told, pointed out to somebody uh, something. And then five, less than three or four minutes later, they just start saying the same thing without even being aware. I, I've seen, and I'm sure I do things like that as well. I mean, I'm not pointing out, but I've seen that many times. So there's that, that exists in us, this inability to control our tongues, to speak badly about others, to say things that we really shouldn't be saying, and people can't control it. They can't control it. So learning to control the tongue is a, is a major thing. All these type things. So if you realize this, you'll gain izzah and, and, and wealth from Allah. Now part of the problem with human beings is they don't want to be impoverished. They don't want to be humbled. They don't want to be... Because they perceive in these qualities uh, uh, abjectness. I don't want to be poor. Right? And yet, the Prophet Sallallahu chose poverty over wealth. He chose it. He didn't have any money in his house. He slept on, on the floor on, a, on a, uh, uh, a bed made out of some leather and palm fibers. Right? He didn't have any uh, jewelry. He didn't have any... He had two pillows in his room where guests used to come. Total poverty. In, in this culture, if that's the way somebody lived, they'd be in a state of total humiliation. Why? Because they're looking at what other people think, not what's the best thing for me. So what he's saying is, is that you'll have dignity with Allah. You're mu'azzas with Allah. You're mu'azzas with Allah. I mean, look at the, in Surat Yasin, uh, the, the, the prophet who came, the two, they, they came to warn the people and the people were threatening them. Allah says, Azazna bithadithin. We gave them izza with a third. So Allah gives izza to whoever He wants. Ya'izu man yasha wa yudhillu man yasha. Right? Allah, tu'izu man yasha wa tudhillu man tasha. You, you give izza to whoever you want and you humble whoever you want. Right? I mean, you look now uh, at people in the world who used to rule the world, and now their offspring are begging. They're begging. They used to rule the world, and now their offspring are begging in the streets. Right? See, it's an amazing thing, and Allah can do that to any people He wants. And so the secret of creation is that if you realize the opposite attribute, that Allah gives you its opposite. In other words, if you realize humility before Allah, Allah will make you aziz before the people. But if you're arrogant with Allah, He'll maybe let it go for a little while, but when He takes you, He completely humbles you before everybody. Right? That's what happens. And so He's really, this is a big secret uh, that He's giving us. So He's saying, indeed, there's no... And then He's reminding us, وَلَا نَجَاتَكَ نَجَاتَ الْقَلْبِ There's no salvation like the heart salvation Right? None. إِذْ كُلُّ جَارِحٍ لَهُ مُلَبِّي Because every limb answers the heart. See, what he's saying is if your heart is saved, your limbs are saved. But if your heart's not safe, your limbs aren't saved. And this is why there's a hadith that the, the tongue, the heart lies under the tongue. 
right? Now the tongue is the most, it's, it's called tarjuman al-qalb. It's the interpreter of the heart. Because it's telling you what's in the heart. That's why a munafiq is, is so wretched because he, he's, he's saying with his tongue what's not in his heart. And that's not what the tongue was created for. It was created to express what was in the heart. So he's oppressing his tongue and his heart. Right? So when you, the heart is, is an amazing organ because the tongue articulates it. Now, the tongue is what takes people to, to, to the hellfire. So if, if the heart is rectified, then the tongue is rectified. And that's why Allah will always say, Ya Say good, be upright in the way you speak because that's an indication that the heart's upright. It's, it's translating what's in your heart. If your tongue's upright, it means your heart's upright. And that's why all the limbs every morning when they wake up in the spiritual world, they, they all shake according to the hadith. And they say to the tongue, Fear Allah with us because if you're straight, we're all straight. And if you go crooked, we're all crooked. Right? That's what all the limbs say to the tongue. And, and so a good deal of, of spiritual work is, is working on the tongue and doing dhikr of Allah, replacing empty chatter with remembrance of Allah, using the tongue for what it was created for, not wasting time with the tongue, not doing all these things. So the tongue is important, but the most important thing is the heart. And what he's saying is um, that Ba'ada wasl bid'i, and he again does a play with the uh, the adab, right? Uh, after the foundation of this this beginning, which is adab, once you've realized adab, and realized that that's the whole point of existence in this world is to have adab with Allah and with the creation of Allah. That's why you were created, to have adab with Allah and to have adab with the creation of Allah, which is why the Quran is called Ma'adabatullah. The place you learn adab. It's in the hadith. It's ma'adabatullah. The place you learn adab. So it was sent or revealed to teach us adab. After you've done that, then he's saying, فَالْإِتْقَانُ لِعِلَلَ الْأَفْئِذَةِ الثُّنْيَانِ The second thing to put on your foundation is to know the diseases of the heart. You have to know that the heart has diseases. Right? So once you've got your, your foundation, which is understanding adab and what it is, then you have to uh, know uh, knowledge of the heart's ailments. So after a fir- you have a firm grasp of this foundation, then a mastery of the heart's infirmities is the second stage. Right? Because you can't get to maqamat. I mean, ultimately what we want is to be right with Allah. But that's, that's trying to get... You're here and you want to get here... And that you know you have to go up like that. So it's trying to get there without going up uh, the stages, the process. And those are darajat. And Allah says He raises people in degrees. So the first degree is you have to uh, recognize what you want, which is adab, and then you have to recognize what's preventing you from getting it. And those are the diseases of the heart. And so He says, "Irfanu amrad al wa sabab kullin wa ma yuziruhu aynan wajab." Knowledge of the diseases of the heart and their causes, because you have to not only know what they are, but what causes them, and how to remove them, is an obligation incumbent on every human being, ayn wajib, or on every adult Muslim. Now, uh, what the ulama say is, you have to you have to have some knowledge of them, right, to 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 free yourself from them, because of the verse in the Quran. That says, He has success, the one who nurtures his soul, and he's destroyed who stunts its growth. So, taskiya, right? Taskiya of nafs, right? And also because Allah says, On that day, nothing benefits them, neither wealth nor children, only the one who comes to Allah with a pure heart. So according to the Qur'an itself, the only people saved on Yawm Al-Qiyamah are people that have qulub salima. How do you get a, a heart, a salim heart? And it says Ibrahim brought a, a, had a sound heart, qalbun salim. 
So we want a qalb salim. How do we get a qalb salim? And it's interesting that salim is related to aslama, right? Aslama, Islam is, is, is moving towards that, aslama. He says that this is the ruling of the Imam al-Ghazali. There's a biographical note, you can read that about Imam al-Ghazali, who's really the master of this science. And he, this poem is really an abridgment of Imam al-Ghazali's fourth volume of the Munjiyat and the Muhlikat and the Munjiyat. Those things that save us and those things that destroy us. But he is the master, radiallahu anhu, of this science. And he's the Mujaddid of the fifth century um, by consensus, by ijma' of the, the ulama that came after him. What is the proof of Islam? Hujjat al-Islam, that's a name that he was given. The proof of Islam, Hujjat al-Islam. That's his name. In other words, what it says is that the fact that Islam can produce somebody like Imam al-Ghazali is a proof that it's true. That's a proof. He's, he himself is a proof of the truth of Islam. That, that's what that means. And he has massive impact on, on Christianity as well. People don't realize that. But he had an incredible impact on Christianity. His books were all translated into Latin within a hundred years after his death, which is phenomenal. And a lot of their theology was from him. Also, the refutation of the philosophers, Tahafat al-Falasifah, a very important book that he wrote, The Incoherence of the Philosophers. 